Hey, badass black girls, and they making big moves. Hey, badass black girls, nothing that you can't do. They are the future, I'm trying to tell you. They want the best, no time to settle. They got the strength to handle the pressure. These are the queens, nobody better. Yeah, yeah, changing the narrative, that is imperative. They about to rock this. Tell the women that you got this. Got no time for people who are toxic. It's all love, good vibes. Uh, you know I got your back, girl. Talking issues that matter. This is badass black girl, yeah. everyone welcome to a new episode of badass black girl and we have another badass woman with us tonight her name is melinda michelle and i'm going to let her introduce herself hi everybody as she said i'm melinda michelle i am an author and a spiritual warfare strategist i by trade i went to school for accounting and finance i'm currently um pursuing my PhD in social psychology. So my education is a little all over the place. Um, and I have re- written 23 books as of the end of 2020. So it's, I've been on this journey for about eight years and um, it's been fun. <laughs> 23 books, let's start, let's start there. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your inspiration. Okay. So I am an avid reader, love, love, love books. I love books that are going to get me. I want every emotion. I want to be mad. I want to be cry, you know, and all of that. So when I um, made the transition to being a Christian and actually trying to behave like a Christian, um, <laughs> I um, was, I'm going to give up secular books. Child, I'm Christian books was born. And I was like, oh no, I can't do this. <laughs> so I ended up writing the book that I wanted to read. Also, there wasn't a lot of diversity in the um, Christian fiction books. And I mean, by ethnicity, by struggles, you know, the struggles were very cookie cutter, like where's God for the person who's really down and out, like the prostitute or the abuse victim or the drug dealer. Like I wanted to know where God was or see where God was for all of those people because he's for everybody, you know not one type of person he's, he's looking out for, so. So let's talk a little bit about your upbringing because okay. you, you mentioned about this, deciding to actually live a Christian life. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your childhood and um, what, what put you exactly on that path. So my parents were, I always tell people my mother was the first Christian I ever met up close and personal. So she was the mother that was praying, you know, about everything. And, you know, she wasn't a big force you to go to church type. You know what I'm saying? We went to church. um, We learned the principles of, I would say more than anything, prayer. I learned more than anything about prayer. And we weren't in church every single day. It wasn't that type of vibe. It wasn't that type of vibe. So I think I didn't develop a toxic relationship with the church. So as an adult, it wasn't something I was trying to run away from. It was kind of like going back home to your foundation. You know, I went to FAMU, HBCU. You get out there and you, oh, this is new. This is fun. Then you go back to your foundation after a while. Um, And my dad was, he really wasn't um, as... um, I guess, into his relationship with Christ in my, in my younger years, but he ended up being a pastor when I became an adult. And so he was a Bible enthusiast. He loved the Bible. So I kind of got my love for the Bible and Bible stories and all that from my dad. And then the foundation of prayer and um, from my mom, but my mother is probably the goofiest person that I know. So she made it fun. It just never it was just never something that that you didn't want to be a part of you know so my mother's a clown and my when my dad passed last year she became the pastor of his church so it's definitely a family legacy um with a christian upbringing i have to say that i also grew up christian and as a Mm -hmm. kid i loved loved it because it was fun um stories and singing Mm -hmm. and just um the idea of being a christian was uh, there, there was a, a being charitable part, but there was also about having that joy inside of you. Yeah. 
Then I grew up and um, I became really annoyed with the church and with everyone who was kind of uh, speaking the word. I was like, you're killing my vibe because some people can really make it feel very boring, mm -hmm. not just um, uh, through the books, but even through the way they act. And I was like, well, anyway, I'm going to keep on moving on and find my own um, you know, drums to, to dance to. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm really intrigued um, how this applies to the craft of writing. What are some strategies that you use in your book to, to keep the stories exciting and a, make sure that um, you don't get that reaction that you got at first where people said, well, Christianity is really boring. How are you gonna write about it? Well, honey, life is ratchet and I just write about real life. And I wanted my Christians to be real. I wanted them to fall. I wanted them to be flawed. I wanted them to, um, you know, not exercise their fruit of the spirit every day. I want them to struggle every day. Like, this is not, I don't wake up every day wanting to be a good Christian. Sometimes people get on your nerves and, you know. Um, and so my readers have affectionately deemed me the queen of petty plot twists. So I literally, at the climax of the story or the twist of the story, I'll pray about it. And I'll tell them, they were like, you want to blame the Holy Ghost? No, but I prayed about it. And I said, Lord, this is where I am. How do I jack up all the characters at the same time? Like, I really, really want, I don't like being able to guess the end of a book. So I really try to make my plot twist, you know, and then I'll, maybe I'll survey some people and be like, if this happened and this happened, what do you think is the next step? And if they, if a, you kind of get a general sense of what the next step is, then I'll throw something else in there to just, you know, kind of make it just, you're not going to guess this, you know. Um, so I want it fun. My characters are real. They, I like going through the emotional gambit. So I make sure that my readers go through the emotional gambit in every book that I write, even if it's a short story. Or my longest novel is like 660 something pages. Which, oh, child, writing that was a beast. But, you know, it was kind of like the end of, of, of the first part of the series. But I just, I want them to experience the book. I want them to feel like they're in the book. And if I don't make my reader mad, I didn't do my job. <laughs> what are some of the things that you struggle with as a, as a writer? Um, struggle with is, for me, I have multiple series. So I have a love series, I have a warfare series, and then I have some standalone stuff. For me, it's sticking to one at a time. So my readers are like, oh, when is it? Oh, I'm writing a love story right now. Oh, I'm writing a warfare book right now. So kind of just sticking to one. And then when kind of balancing it for me, because writing brings me complete joy. I love diving down the rabbit holes with my characters. So I have to give up my fun to be an adult and work on my PhD and work on all this other stuff and you know everything else that you have going on and go to work. And I was like, ah, I just want to write. <laughs> So it's like, okay, put the characters down. Don't play with them today. And, you know, so kind of maybe making a block scheduling and sticking to it is my issue. <laughs> Time management can be such a, a, a huge issue. And I'm actually uh -huh. so surprised and impressed that you're not doing this full time. You mentioned uh, working on 23 that, that's the right number, right? 23 yeah. books, and you're still holding a job that is not sitting down in front of the computer and working on those books. That, that's extraordinary. And I want to know more. Um, what do you do for a living? Um, well, right now I am an accountant at my church. And so there is some flexibility there. But when I first started writing, I did quit my job in corporate America. I did financial and investment accounting and um, I kind of took away from that. So it was about mm, maybe a year and a half, two years where I just was able to focus on writing. So I think I wrote like three books, but everything else has been a balancing act. And I am one of those people who discovered that there really are 24 hours in the day and you get to pick and choose which ones work for you. And there was one part of my life where 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. I was conquering the world. <laughs> so whenever I find a block of time that works for me in that season, I fully take advantage of it. So one thing, one thing I will say is that you are definitely blessed because I've heard of people who are good with 
words and others, they are good with numbers, but you're using both parts of the brain. You're an accountant, you write, and I want to talk about that third aspect of your life, uh, being a spiritual warfare strategist. Tell us a little bit about that. This sounds okay. so <laughs> I heard that term in prayer one day, and because, so my, my Chronicles of Warfare series, it is based on um, the scripture, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So you get the point of view of the story from the angels, the demons, and the humans. So it's kind of like a full 360 of what's happening, you know, in the spirit realm and what's happening in the natural realm. And so as I began to write the, those first seven books, there are going to be 12 in the series, and 10 of them have been written. But the first seven books, I got a lot of people inboxing me and emailing me and texting me like, oh, I'm, I thought I was crazy. I've experienced this. You know, I write about a lot of different spiritual encounters and stuff like this. And people just really were able to connect with something they didn't want to openly share with people because they thought people would think they were crazy because they had these experiences and stuff like that. So I would get like a lot of questions and stuff. And so I would just um, you know, I would respond and answer people and different things like that. And as that progressed, I had people like, why don't you just teach this? Like, you need to teach this like a class or something. And that's how I ended up starting my conferences. I've, I've done two. And then I would have people who would come to me with individual, like, this is something that I really have going on in my life. I'm really trying to move past and all of this. And I would end up writing a personal live warfare strategy for them. Like, this is what you need to focus on. This is how you do it. This is the amount of time you need to spend, that, that kind of thing. And it's just something that developed. And it actually, I didn't realize I was doing it until I ended up with a book club in a prison because a reader of mine shared a book in a prison and they actually asked for me to come to their creative writing class. And I ended up with this book club in this women's prison. And that flabbergasted me. Like, I was like, what? This is so cool. They were amazing. And so they had a lot of spiritual warfare questions and I ended up teaching and training right on the spot. And God was like, hello, like I'm trying to teach you. This is what I want you to do. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. And so that's how that came to be. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Uh, I have to ask you, how do you keep your joy? Because we're talking, we can feel it coming from you. We feel it from your books. But of course, it's something that needs to be cultivated because, mm -hmm. I mean, the past few months have been so hard on yeah. everything. So <laughs> how do you keep going? Um, again, I go back to that foundation with my mom and my parents and stuff. And, you know, it was always run to God. So like when you're weary, when you're overwhelmed, you know, go to God. And because I have been given insight and revelation to write the type of books that I write and to write the things that I write. If I truly have faith in this God that I believe in, then I have to apply that to my life. And so there are times that I'll, my characters will get me back in my, in my point of faith because 2020 was really, I think losing my dad probably kind of threw me for a loop. It wasn't a, oh, I'm angry with God because I get it. He's sovereign. Like that's life that happens. That's one thing that's guaranteed in life. People are going to pass but it was unexpected. And so um, it's kind of like, sometimes God is the one you want to blame, but he's also the source of your peace and protection. So it's kind of like, eh, you know, in your prayer time, have a little argument, have a little tantrum, you know what I'm saying? But okay, Lord, now I need you to comfort me. And so it's just rehearsing what he's done for me in the past that I know was only God, you know, and just kind of trying to remember that. But when you have those human moments, I read this in a book years ago, um, having a merry heart in a Martha world. And she said, if you need to throw a temper tantrum, throw a temper tantrum. She said, but set a timer for 10 minutes and do whatever you need to do in them 10 minutes. And then when that timer goes off, take a breath, get it together and figure it out. And so I take those moments, I have those tantrums, <laughs> but then I only wallow in it for a short amount of time. And then it's like, okay, Michelle, get it together. What, what are we gonna do? Like, you just can't sit here forever. You know what I mean? So. And um, my next question, I mean, um, I don't know if it's a fair question to ask. You, you might not know. Um, but I have a feeling that you might know, okay? Because you you you're writing so much on the topic on on um, Christianity and 
the battles that we fight, those inner battles that we fight every day. If, and, and also I'm asking because you just mentioned something concrete that you do when you're questioning um, events and you're trying to be centered, this idea of having a tantrum and then calming down and remembering um, that Lord is everything, right? Mm -hmm. So for someone who's completely lost, they maybe they grew up um, in, in a household where um, Christianity was practiced, but then they kind of quote unquote grew out of it or they, um, they, they still practice their faith, but they're wondering what's the point. For those people who are really um, down, not understanding what's happening, questioning their faith, questioning God, questioning everything, what are some of the concrete steps that you would recommend to, so, so that they don't feel that sense of um, just, one wondering without knowing where you're going. Okay. What are five things that can bring you back to your center? So my late pastor used to say all the time, we are spirit beings having a human experience. And you can't discount your human experience because when you do, you kind of set yourself up for failure because you're gonna feel what you're gonna feel and you're gonna experience life because we're this is what the situation is. And so I think a lot of people are introduced to church and not introduced to God, which are two totally different things. And the church, we end up seeing flawed people and a lot of people get church hurt. And then, um, like I said, that toxic when a lot of black people grew up in church, they were in church every single day. You know what I'm saying? And they didn't have that family time. They didn't have those, those tools that a family would normally develop and so my advice is to, because I don't, I think it's okay to question God because as my friend up says, he's the oldest person we know. I mean, he has the answer. So <laughs> if you got a question, he's probably a good person to go to. And so I would say, just set aside a time. I would say, give yourself three weeks because it takes 21 days to develop a habit and be intentional about the time you set aside to spend with God in prayer and the time you set aside to read the Bible. And there is a version of the Bible for whatever reading level that you're on. Do not run up to the King James Version trying to figure out what they're talking about. <laughs> when you have a message version or an NIV version, you know what I'm saying, that can speak in a language that is, is real to you, right? And then in this time, I think it's very important to be intentional because the Bible tells us that if we seek him, we will find him. And so if you're making the effort to even be a Christian, like you might as well go all in because otherwise what's the point? Like, you know what I'm saying? Go out, wild out, have fun, do what you want to do. Don't ha I don't see the point in half stepping this journey. Um, so that would be my thing. I would say, give it 21 days and be intentional about sitting still, praying. And when I say pray, because a lot of people, I don't know how to pray. I'm having a conversation. That's prayer. You know what I'm saying? And when you pray, make it your practice to be still. I usually set my timer for about 15 minutes and I'm still because prayer is a conversation. If you're the only one talking, it's a monologue. He will speak back, you know, and he speaks in different ways. So don't limit him. There are many ways he can talk to you, but you'll know his voice because one <laughs> He, when he tell you to do something, it's really something you don't want to do anyway. It's nothing you came up with on your own. You'd be like, no, that ain't me because I wouldn't have volunteered for that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And two, spend time in his word because that kind of shows, not kind of, that shows God's character. And I remember someone coming to me and it broke my heart. She wanted to have a, wanted me to do a warfare strategy for her. She was like, every time you talk about God, you're laughing and, you know, you tell us what he said to you and it seems so fun. She was like, I don't know that God. I know the wrathful one that's sending you to hell. That's the only thing I've ever been taught. And I was like, why do we just, yeah, the Old Testament can get a little rough. <laughs> There's a lot of grace and mercy in the New Testament. And I think that when you look at God as a father, and when you look at that God is love versus this wrathful being that wants to send you to hell, 
I think that completely changes the dynamic, that completely changes the approach. Now, the other thing is, if you are a person who does not have a good relationship with your earthly father or a father figure, it's really hard for you to conceptualize a good father. So you don't believe that God is all of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's just no way because fathers aren't like that. So we kind of liken our conceptualization of a father on earth to him. And that's not the truth. That is our emotions and our trauma and our experiences, you know, painting God in a picture that is false. And so um, even when he chastises you, when you get in trouble and you feel that conviction because you know you was acting a fool, um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But he still comes in with that loving peace afterwards, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, he might turn around super and give you a blessing. He's like, okay, I know you still love me. You know? <laughs> I know you forgive me for showing out the other day, right? So I think I would be intentional about it and I would give myself 21 days and be consistent with prayer and, and finding something in the word. And if you cannot conceptualize any other part of the Bible, read the Psalms or read the Proverbs. They're very easy to understand. You know, they're very, they're like, um, they're music, you know, music and wisdom. So it kind of resonates with you because they're, David has some very, very human moments in Psalms and Solomon is hilarious in Proverbs, you know, and it's just good wisdom. <laughs> and if we want to learn a little bit more about your work um, as a writer, um, what book would you recommend that we start with? Let's, let's say I wanted to, I came to you and I wanted to know out of the 23 books, which one should be my first so that then I can find my way through all the others. What is the first book for me to read? Okay. I would say Surviving Sunday. That is the start of the Chronicles of Warfare. And my warfare books, they do have romance in them. And then, but if you're a romance person, start with Color Me Blind. And then if you're a ratchet person and you just want to be entertained, you can start with my new series. Um, it's really neat, Spiritual Street. The first book is called Wife and Mistress. So, <laughs> so, that's, so I kind of have something for every personality. And usually when a reader finishes the series that they started with, they'll go to the other series and, you know, kind of. But then I do have some people who are just team love and just team war. So. <laughs> And how do you um, manage during the pandemic um, to continue to blossom in your writing career? I know that you've always been very active with promoting your books and meeting people. You mentioned, for instance, even going to a book club a, at a jail. Mm -hmm. um, how do you navigate the writing world while, while socially distancing? Well, one thing that I did was I started, um, I've always had a personal Facebook group with my readers. I'm very, very, I love, I'm very close to my readers. Um, so I've always did that. But then I started um, going live every Friday morning in there. And we just kind of talk about all kinds of stuff. So that's been really, really fun. It's been, it's been a source of a highlight in the week with all the crazy stuff. Um, and then when I did my conference this year, we did it virtually, which was cool because even though I missed my live audience to feed off of, a lot more people were able to attend. I had some people, you know, across the country that had wanted to attend and it was too much to travel. So it kind of had its pros and cons, but I've just been very active on social media and um, just kind of spending time with my readers. Um, and then I recently launched my Patreon platform because people are, again, like I said, people are always asking me spiritual warfare questions. They're always wanting to know. And one thing this year that I just, I want to be very intentional about the way that I live my life. I don't want to just accept what is when God has given us the power and authority to pray and, you know, pursue things like that. So I started the Patreon platform and it's where if you want more spiritual warfare content, you can get a basic level, or intermediate level, or a, um, a warrior level and then i have a community of my readers my new series is really neat spiritual streets i launched the first book in for public but the rest of the series because they're novellas they'll come through patreon first so my patreons will get that first thing so it's been really fun because that's a it's spiritual warfare but it's a totally different genre for me the characters are kind of ratchet and <laughs> ridiculous so that's fun but again like i said I, I always want to show god is for everybody like 
it doesn't matter what your walk in life is. It doesn't matter what you've done. Like he loves you too. And if you want to know him, he's available. So I've just been really um, using the online resources that have been available. Um, but yeah, I truly enjoy spending time with my readers. I have great, great, great readers. And what are you working on now? So right now I am working on the second book in um, It's Really New Spiritual Streets. It's called Duplicity Denied. It comes out March 31st. And my readers are throwing a tantrum because they want a full length novel. And this year, because of the pandemic and everything, um, my conference, I usually have a book that goes with my conference. So that was two books. So I spent my year writing nonfiction books, which are not my favorite, but I know they're helpful. <laughs> and so I really, I was like, I want to go back to my fiction books. So I turned 40 in June and my goal is to release another novel then. So I'm kind of, I'm writing this one and writing that one, but I need to pick one. It's, like I said, I got to pick one and stick to it and say, okay, let's write this one so we can get it out for your 40th birthday. So um, I'm working on the current, the new series and then trying to pick which book I want to come out from the other series for my 40th birthday. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, good luck with this endeavor. And I yeah. hope that you will keep us posted about everything that's going on when you finish this book and future projects. If someone wanted to attend one of your conferences, where can they find you? Um, they can find me on melindamichelle21.com and just reach out to me on the contact page. I actually teach the conferences. So when you look at what conferences are available, I can come to your prayer group or your women's group, of course, now to be virtually, but I can come to your group and teach that course if you so desire. And then also I have um, the Gimme Academy. It is um, on teachable.com, search the Gimme Academy, G-M-M-E. And then my conferences are online. You can actually go to the classes online. There's some other classes there too that I teach. So. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda, for coming and sharing your work with us and telling us uh, some of what we needed to know <laughs> about spiritual warfare. And um, it's so comforting to know that we can reach out to you if we want to learn yeah. more about the strategies that you're there to teach us. Um, we can have conferences. We can contact you, may become part of your reader. Readers. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I love hanging out with my readers. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. You are absolutely a badass black girl. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you again soon. Okay. <laughs>